about uh, GDPR implementation for OSM. Uh, all right, hi everyone. Um, I'm Kathleen Liu. Um, I'm an attorney with the legal slash licensing working group of the Open Street Map Foundation. And um, so if you are not familiar with uh, LWG, uh, we're a working group um, that deals uh, with licensing for uh, open street map, uh, licensing guidance and, and other issues, um, and also uh, various legal issues that affect the open street map community. Um, in particular, what we're going to talk about today is privacy law. Um, if you are interested in learning more about the various working groups of OSMF, there is a session at 5.40 today in the main room. Uh, where you can learn about joining a working group. Um, so, so the LWG uh, hi, sorry, <laughs> has been uh, working on getting uh, OSMF ready for GDPR for almost a year now. Um, and so uh, I am not a privacy lawyer in my day job, actually. Um, I'm just a lawyer. And uh, part of the process of helping to get OSMF ready um, I did quite a bit of research um, talking to experts about what we should do and so today I am going to walk all of you through uh, what we learned and uh, what we, uh, what OSMF has uh, planned. So this is uh, sort of our agenda for today. First I'm going to give you some context about uh, about GDPR and its general impacts. Um, then I'm going to give you a crash course on what the law says, um, and then describe what uh, OSMF has been working on all this time, uh, what's next on the horizon for our plans, and then go over some uh, questions uh, both that have already been asked and also from the audience. Okay, so. What is GDPR? It is a European privacy law. Uh, it affects, uh, so it is a very complicated law. It went to, into effect on May 25th of this year. Um, and it has a lot of parts. That's what makes it complicated. It's what makes it difficult to uh, follow all of the parts of the regulation. Um, and the penalties are, can be very stiff. Uh, needless to say, OSMF does not have very much money, so we uh, would be nowhere close to being able to afford the penalties uh, should the regulators uh, ever come after us. Uh, so th this, uh, is, I pulled these quotes from a couple of news articles that surveyed um, what companies were doing about GDPR uh, shortly before May 25th. So the one that I found most striking was that uh, in January, so five months before GDPR Day, a quarter of London businesses didn't know what it was. So <laughs> they they had they they just they, they had no idea they, they this there was this new law coming. Um, and also, again, looking at some articles. Uh, before and companies were really struggling with implementing uh, procedures that uh, conform to GDPR. Um, a yeah, Microsoft apparently supposedly had 300 engineers working on it. I heard someone say that they had 100 lawyers also working on it. Um, for OSMF, we are all volunteers. Uh, we don't have uh, these kinds of resources but we are trying our best. Um, the, the other thing that was really striking uh, was that the data protection authorities, which in the EU are supposed to be uh, enforcing GDPR, they were not ready either. Um, so this article was from three days before May 25th, and so it's referencing a survey from one month before GDPR went to effect, and uh, 17 of the 24 uh, European data protection authorities were not ready for GDPR. Um, so it has. Oh. 
Uh, so this is a, this is basically a, a summary of uh, what things were like <laughs> before May 25th. And uh, after, um, it's been now two months, uh, but things are not a lot better. Um, because uh, we saw a rash of complaints that were filed on May 25th, on May 26th. Um, but the data protection authorities have not really acted on that yet. Um, it, historically, it has taken, uh, you know, sort of EU's enforcement agencies, you know, up to a year, at least, you know, something like six, eight months, um, to really, uh, you know, put out any decisions. So right now, at the two-month mark, we haven't got those decisions, um, and those decisions are really sort of the, the guidance um, that uh, everybody who's affected by GDPR would need. Uh, so right now, we don't really know very much. <laughs> okay, so now we go to what the law actually says. Uh, so first, what does GDPR stand for? Uh, General Data Protection Regulation. Uh, this sounds so simple. Uh, it, it consists of 11 chapters. There are 99 articles. In total, it's 88 pages. Uh, that's not counting the recitals, which are sort of uh, the you know, little descriptions they gave of some things. Uh, if you would like to read it, uh, please go ahead. This is the link. Uh, if, you would, if you just want to, a summary, you could just keep listening. <laughs> So GDPR was uh, really a way to try to codify these basic principles. And you know, I think we can all agree that these are things that make sense. Um, that uh, you know, if you want to have privacy protection, uh, these are important things to consider. Um, when, when using data. Um, but as we'll see uh, when we kind of get to the details, um, these are the guiding principles, but the details can be very complicated and confusing. Okay, so first off, um, one common misconception is I'm not European, I'm not in the EU, this doesn't affect me. Now we are in Italy, so we're in the EU, but um, GDPR affects everyone who gets personal data from an EU, uh, EU resident. Uh, so even if you are a company that is outside the EU, if you have any EU customers, if you are OSM and you have EU mappers, uh, GDPR affects you. Um, and the definition of personal data is very, very broad. Um, so it's any data that uh, even if the individual piece of data does not identify a person, if it, the pieces collectively identify a person, then that's considered personal data. We know from sort of the guidance that was given before May 25th that things like your name, your email, your IP address are definitely personal data. Um, there hasn't really been as much guidance given to sort of at what level you know, beyond, you know, less precise level, uh, you, it stops being considered personal data. And this is only for uh, people, like real people, not company people. Uh, your your uh, a company's data is not considered uh, personal data. Okay. Um, the other thing about GDPR that's pretty broad is what it covers. So, processing. Uh, is pretty much anything, uh, any sort of internet activity is going to involve processing, storage, or transfer. Um, it's, it's pretty much using the data at all. Um, so there are a couple of uh, exemptions from the law. So a big one is uh, personal household activities. That's basically your personal address book. Um, the recital said that your personal social media is included, uh, but the but the platform is not exempt. And then there are what are considered uh, acceptable reasons for processing data. 
Um, so legitimate interests is one that we will be talking about in a lot more detail because it's very important to OSM. Um, another one is consent, but it has to be very uh, clear consent that is expressly given. Uh, you can't sort of hide it on, on, on the back page. Uh, you know, people have to really sort of check the box to give it. Um, it can't be assumed. Uh, performance of a contract is, for example, uh, if you buy something from a company and they have to ship it to you, well, you have to uh, you have to give them your address in order for that transaction to be completed. Um, there are uh, extra restrictions on certain categories of data. Uh, one is for minors, um, and uh, another is for sensitive. Uh, categories of data, for example, what your religion is, uh, your medical information. Uh, fortunately, we don't quite have that as a normal data type in uh, OSM. Um, another part of the regulation, the, so transparency is a big part, right? So for transparency, this means telling uh, people that are you are getting data from what you are collecting, why you are collecting it, and what you are doing with it. Um, so the disclosure requirements uh, typically show up as people including this type of information on a privacy policy. Um, another uh, important part of the regulation uh, that affects OSM is something that is colloquially called the right to be forgotten. Um, it's really uh, about a right to have data deleted. Um, but, the, this part is key, uh, the right is only absolute when the basis of processing is on consent. So you can withdraw your consent at any time. But, if you have a, there is another lawful basis, uh, for example, legitimate interests, then whether the data needs to be deleted uh, it depends on sort of this, the, you go back to the regular evaluation of legitimate interest versus the person's uh, interest in having the data deleted, and there is this balancing. Um, for transfers, any uh, transfers to another country uh, must uh, follow uh, certain regulations. Um, and there is a list of approved jurisdictions uh, where the uh, transfer has been deemed acceptable because the, uh, the country that the data is going to uh, is considered to have sufficient uh, privacy protection. Um, and then there are also um, some uh, contractual documents that you can sign to promise that you would uh, adhere to sort of a heightened standard of, uh, of privacy. All right, so now I'm going to talk about uh, what OSMF has been doing in light of that long list of things um, that have to uh, be considered. So these are sort of the things that we were thinking about um, as we went into this process. Um, obviously, uh, data and open data is very important to OSM. Um, and we want to keep data as open as possible uh, within the bounds of the law. Uh, another consideration was, you know, where does OSM uh, or OSMF have personal data? Um, people are not supposed to say on the map, "This is my house," <laughs> um, but uh, you know. You know, that is a possibility. Um, and then, of course, there is information like um, our usernames that, you know, if anybody could go and go and see that um, on the website. Um, there is some personal data that OSMF has due to memberships or when you sign up for an account with OSM because we don't not, uh, allow anonymized editing. Um, and then there's sort of the social aspects of OSM, which, you know, like state of the map, 
um, but also mapping parties and local meetups uh, where you know mappers want to get come together and uh, and get to know each other. And how does all of that fit in with this very protective um, law about your personal data? Um, so just so you can see, I'm not going to read through all of this. It's quite a bit, but this is sort of how this has come together over time. Um, the uh, the working groups and uh, the board have been thinking about this um, and have explored a lot, um, asked experts, um, and done research, and then you know went back to the community at several points um, to get thoughts. And we are um, we're still still going through some of this process, which I'll talk about. Um, so the, the first part is really important. This is how we fit with GDPR. Um, legitimate interest is uh, appropriate for uh, an, a, an organization that's goal is to have a widely available yet accurate map of the world. Um, OSMF's purposes are different than uh, a lot of sort of the companies um, that were the target of GDPR. Uh, and because of that, um, we have we have justifications um, that don't necessarily apply uh, to everyone. Um, but legitimate basis allows us uh, to not have to change so much and not have to lock up so much um, of the data that, uh, that is so important to the community. Uh, we did find that there were some things that uh, we felt like we needed to uh, tweak in order to uh, comply with GDPR. Um, there is a white paper that is available. Um, it's been available uh, for uh, several months now, but if you haven't seen the message go out to the listservs and such, and you want to read about all of the research that was done, uh, and sort of the summary of the conclusions, uh, there's a link here. Um, I, and these, I will put these slides out, so you don't have to try to capture all of this right now. Um, so this is uh, sort of the things that um, we, in looking at uh, the law, we determined that OSMF probably needed. Um, so the first is the privacy policy, uh, which you uh, may or may not have seen. Uh, we needed an updated privacy policy to account for the parts of uh, GDPR that required certain disclosures um, about uh, the data that OSMF has and what it's used for. Um, previously, um, some of this data was in sort of documentation uh, for you know, the APIs, um, or for, um, or you know, it was worded in a very technical manner and not all centralized. So now, um, now that is not. So the um, these are still in draft form. The new terms of use. The main purpose of the new terms of use is to expressly limit use of personal data that is in map data, that is in uh, the data that OSM has to the uses that would fit the legitimate interests of OSM. Um, the other pieces we, the, so basically, you know, you are not supposed to use OSM data to go try to stalk someone. And I think that the community at large 
already understands that. Uh, but it was not expressly written out that you cannot do this, and if you do this, you will get banned. Right? We will, we will, we will, we will block you from access. Um, you know, same thing where we have um, policies about, you know, don't use sources that are not appropriate. Um, don't spam the the email listserv, um, and things like that. But they weren't, you know, all in a document where everyone who is editing the map. Um, and getting this data, you know, agrees. Yes, I'm going to, I'm going to um, live by um, these rules. So, the, um, the this is, I think, like the, the really important part, <coughs> which is that in order to support OSM and support a worldwide open map. Um, we, as mappers in general, the community at large, and not just sort of like a very limited set of people, have to be able to have access to know that, you know, someone is mapping somewhere, um, that they've mapped other things, and to be able to communicate. Um, so, you know, for example, uh, say you see an edit and someone in, has inserted some curse words into a street name. Well, in order to, you know, to, for us to have efficiency in having an accurate map, you're going to want to know, okay, wait, did this, was this an accident? Or is this somebody who is a troll, who is, you know, uh, just kind of, you know, throwing things out there? What else has this person edited, right? You need to know, you need to be able to see sort of all of the edits of this person. Is this person new? Has this been, person been at this for a while, right? Um, if somebody has edited something and there's a question as to whether they used uh, an unauthorized source, you want to be able to uh, message that person and say, where did you get this? You know, did you, did you copy this from somewhere? Um, and, you know, if they don't respond, you may have to look, okay, where else has this person edited? You know, are these other edits also from suspect sources? Um, or maybe the person responds and says, oh, this was from here, but this other stuff was not, right? That is all very important to having a map. And of course, we have uh, a lot of what personal data in OSM is used for is to sort of support the overall community and able to do being able to do these things efficiently. Um, so as I said, uh, we want to make sure that personal data um, is protected and not abused. Um, so the main ways that we're looking at that is to make sure everybody agrees that they're not going to abuse this data before they have access to it. Um, now, the easy way to do that is uh, already um, there are a lot of things where you have to be logged in to do, including edit. Um, and so the idea is that in order to have access to the metadata fields uh, that contain personal data, especially things like username, user ID, you're going to have to be logged in and have agreed uh, to the new terms or to do that. Um, OSMF is uh, also storing IP addresses for a, long, uh, a shorter amount of time and doing masking, so we don't have nearly as much of that as we did before. And um, a lot of this is sort of formalizing sort of the custom of what we were doing before. Um, so things that are not changing. Um, so the, your email has always um, been generally private, though um, admins, of course, have access because we need to be able to contact anyone who edits about their edits. Um, but, uh, you know, the, but that's not sort of out there for everyone to, to have. Um, IP addresses are also um, limited to uh, 
for operations um, reasons. And then you can, of course, choose to share uh, what you like about yourself with the community. So um, if you know, we hope to not have to change too much for the community at large. Um, if you uh, use OSM data um, in a map, uh, if you are sort of using it to navigate, um, you probably won't see any changes. Um, the, there shouldn't be personal data in the geographic data itself. Um, if you uh, are uh, sort of an, an editor, um, you you know you already need to be logged in to edit. Um, so we are hoping the, to be able to work with the uh, maintainers of the various editing tools uh, so that it's seamless um, between now and when this is all fully implemented. Um, that you know you sort of agree once to the terms of use in conjunction with like the OSM website, uh, and then the login knows that you have agreed, and you know you never have to worry about it again. So, so just as a sort of an example, um, you know that we OSM, uh, OSM Cha is a, a data. Uh, a validation tool um, where you can sort of do filters to see, uh, you know, let's see uh, everything edited in this area um, by uh, one mapper, or let's look at uh, change set by change set uh, edits in an area. Um, and uh, it can be very helpful. Um, there's another talk about sort of all the details of OSM talk. We can be very helpful in uh, catching problems in the map. Um, but uh, the hope is to sort of integrate the login into OSM Cha uh, so you, know, you can continue to use the tool uh, without interruption. Um, another example, you know, to see uh, how fellow members have mapped uh, and to see who is nearby. Um, it is really helpful to the community to be able to uh, connect with fellow mappers, um, to sort of learn from fellow mappers and to work together. You know, that's sort of what we're all here for. Um, and tools like this you know, help us find each other. Uh, but again, we have to be careful uh, not uh, that these tools are not used uh, in, to, you know, to stalk somebody. Um, another uh, legitimate interest, um, according to GDPR, is research. Um, and research is certainly an important com uh, component of the, how the community uses uh, OSM. Um, and it's uh, generally fairly straightforward um, to not use the data for any purpose that would be contrary to uh, the, uh, the anticipated new terms. Um, the, the only thing researchers, I think, really have to be careful about is to not further share that data without a promise from you know, the recipient that they are you know, going to follow the same rules, or they can sort of use summaries and share the summaries that don't have any uh, personal data. Um, so a thing to keep in mind uh, for community projects is that if you process uh, or store personal data, um, you, you, even if you, what you have is sort of just a copy of the personal data that OSM has, that makes you a controller um, under the law, and that means that you have to follow these rules as well. Um, so you know if you if you are running a, a project, then, then you know what we um, in legal working group are 
you know, hoping to be able to help you with is to offer some templates and such. Um, but you have to pay attention. <laughs> Um, so, uh, as I said, the terms of use have been drafted, um, but uh, they have not yet been implemented. Uh, so there's some discussion about exactly what they say, um, uh, community discussion, board discussion, uh, before uh, there will be a vote. Um, and then, of course, uh, the technical implementation, um, the, uh, the uh, I don't know if you've heard about the server move, but the operations working group has been very busy lately. Uh, so this is probably the next big project from a technical standpoint. Um, so we're probably looking at uh, a couple of months out. Um, and there will be communications going out on the listserv and uh, as well as uh, some diary posts and such. Um, so you'll see more about that um, going out. Um, and then, you know, there's uh, some other things that we um, hope that we will uh, be able to do um, down the road as well uh, in terms of helping the community uh, with GDPR and its requirements. Okay. Um, so. Uh, we had, um, I'm going to try to address a few questions that um, people usually have, and then uh, after I do that, I'll open it up to the floor. Okay, so um, if you are just using uh, a map that is based on OSM, uh, this GDPR changes will probably not affect you. Um, the license is still uh, ODBL, um, and there shouldn't uh, be personal data in, um, in what you have. Um, if you are an editor, uh, if you are a mapper, um, this should not affect your contributions to the map. Um, as I said, some of the uh, metadata that uh, may, is likely to be personal data um, will be you know, subject to the new terms of use. Um, but hopefully none of you are stopping it anyway. So. Um, so this is sort of the list of what we think uh, the metadata that is likely to contain personal data is. Um, so basically, this is, uh, we're looking at information that when you, when you look at that set of information, uh, is likely to identify a person. So um, information about, so, uh, so you know, usernames, obviously, a lot of people use their name as their username or they might use the same uh, username as they do in social media on like another account, for example. It can be pretty easy to find somebody. Um, information about how a person edits can also be very, very revealing, uh, especially if you have a person's history of edits. Um, a lot of times people start editing near home so if you, you know, look at a mapper's edits and you go sort of back to the beginning, you might be able to see, oh, you know, this this is probably their house, <laughs> or at least when they lived where when they started editing. Um, uh, also, um, if you you know, often you can see, you know, this person probably lives in this neighborhood because they're editing around this area. Um, and information and comments can be things like, oh, you know, I visited here uh, and uh, on this day, you know, and saw saw this on the map. Um, so we are uh, trying to uh, ensure that that data will not be used um, by making sure that people who have access to that uh, have agreed uh, to the new terms. Um, the one question mark, uh, the big question mark is timestamp. 
uh, because uh, it can be very revealing, uh, especially if you have it down to um, a very fine level of detail, because you can see uh, if of all these uh, edits, if all these changes were made at the same time, that you can sort of correlate them together and say, oh, this was probably all one person. Um, especially if you are looking at an area that is not uh, updated very frequently, uh, you can kind of let's say, oh, this is kind of uh, get a sense that somebody was like walking around, for example. Um, but at the same time, timestamp is also very helpful if you just are trying to update the map and try to ingest the updates. Right? If you have an application, you're like, okay, I need today's, I need today's edits. Um, uh, and well, you 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 don't you don't want to not know which ones are for today. Um, so we're we're still figuring out um, how exactly uh, that's going to be presented. Okay. So if you have a project uh, that is using data that is. Uh, likely to contain personal data. Um, probably the easiest thing uh, that, uh, to do is to have people log in um, it, to have access to those fields. Uh, it doesn't necessarily mean that people have to log in to have access to all fields. Um, if you want to sort of like, you know, have a kind of a tiered access. Um, so for example, you have the map itself. Uh, in public, um, but then information about um, about the editors of the map might be behind a login. But that is um, probably going to be the easiest way of dealing with GDPR. Um, though uh, LMG, we are trying to provide some templates um, and some information so that you just fill in, kind of fill in, make it easier for community projects to deal with GDPR. Okay, uh, so I hope we have some questions from the audience. Um, I will tell you that uh, it says in the program that the session is not recorded, but Brian over here is helpfully recording. Uh, hopefully we'll be able to get that video up sometime later. <laughs> Yeah. Just a clarification on what you had said about the OWG and the server, which is now done, by the way. There's probably almost no, there's probably nothing the OWG needs to do. All that is conceivable is allocating more storage space for when we've got two sets of planets, but that's not something that would be needed immediately. It's long future, so there's nothing waiting on the OWG for work. While that's undoubtedly true, it still has to be done. I was saying that uh, the technical side, uh, the, everyone's been very busy, and so not too much pressure on the technical side. I think it's true for the technical side in general, just not specifically. It, 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 many technical people have been busy with the movie, the conference, and everything. Uh, one in. <coughs> I told us a lot about the metadata, well, GDPR about the data, metadata, but what about the coverage of GDPR about the data, like uh, contact address email, uh, email address and contact phone number in the in the database? Um, so uh, OSMF, uh, so we have emails for uh, everyone who is a mapper. Um, those emails are not publicly available. Um, they never have been. That's not changing. Um, I don't believe that people include like their the, phone numbers. Like for a shop, the contact address, it's sometimes uh, Mr. John Smith at gmail.com for the oh, contact oh, email address. And for, for a store for, that's mapped. Yeah, yeah. So um, stores are not considered persons. Um, yes, it's possible for an individual's uh, phone number to be the same as a store's, um, but, uh, but 
generally speaking, a company, so a, 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 you know, if it's a retail shop, for example, a company is not considered a natural person under GDPR. So even if the store use his private email address as a contact uh, email address? So the, my view of it is, is that the address is the address for the store. Because if, for example, the store moved but the person still lived there, then the, uh, the address for the store moves with the store yeah, to the new one. The, new the, the email address, not the physical address, the email address. The email address should also be the email address of the store. Yeah, Even if the person like sends personal email from it. But if the, yeah, the contact email address is yeah, John Smith at gmail.com, is private address. I, is email, so I think that this is an area where the data authorities just simply have not given sufficient guidance. Okay. Um, and I think that you know, maybe we'll see more guidance um, on that uh, down the road, but for now, it's, it is a little bit illogical. Okay. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, I think there was, oh. I just quickly want to comment, it's probably the same comment that Freddie was, was made. We now and then do actually have situations where there is personal data in the database and stuff that people consider personal data that we do not consider personal data. For example, the house of the house number address. And we have in the past received complaints and that's what we removed. I think we address your point a bit in the terms of use that we say that you should not be entering personal data. And actually there's a very large gray area where we, you know, it's going to be very difficult to make a hard call. And I think we just have to rely on the good judgment of our contributors to not put stuff in which is actually We're also dealing with a situation where generally this store owner has put this up on their shelf. Hi, Ed. So um, you spoke about um, sort of potentially having different um, terms, possibly for community projects. Are there any rules um, that you know about in terms of sort of humanitarian efforts? Um, you know, in areas where there might, have, example, last year had the hurricanes in the Caribbean, for example, or you know anything along those lines. Um, so. When I was uh, speaking about community projects, it was about sort of um, people who are using that data. Um, so uh, humanitarian uses, um, I think, would uh, be another type of uh, legitimate interest. The um, other thing is that uh, GDPR, uh, it, it, it is a law that protects the privacy of EU residents. So um, if it is mapping in the Caribbean, um, then uh, GDPR may affect sort of like the metadata we have about the mappers. So you know, user you, but that's not the same as having an effect on what is mapped. So um, I would expect it to not actually have very much effect for say mapping in the Caribbean. So. I work for the Red Cross, just to put the hat on for a second. There's something called a data protection impact assessment. So anybody who's doing a data project in the humanitarian space should do that. There's also something called the Handbook for Data Protection, which goes through the guidelines of it. And so I'm sure our allies in the different humanitarian groups, whether it's EOF or HOT or whatever, are going to do that. I was just going to say, my understanding of GDPR, so I'm just on a big GDPR implementation myself, is that if an email address is um, John Smith at Microsoft.com, that's still classed as a personal email address because an individual can be identified by that even though it's at their business address and that the only things that um, don't classify are things like info at or sales at or something like that, which is non-person specific. Right, so, um, so I, I have the same understanding, but the kind of email address that in my mind is likely to be mapped. Um, sort of like, you know, this is the store, right? Here's the name of the store, the address of the store, um, the website of the store, and then an email. That email address 
is I think much more likely to be the more like info or sales type of email address than a person's name. Um, of course, you know there are circumstances where if it is an individual's like little little retail shop where um, you you know it is um, a little like more gray I think. Um, but again, you know we 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 tell people you know don't put personal data um, into into the math itself. And then the other thing that we've um, come across is trying to work out how to validate a genuine request to remove data, um, which is very tricky because then you have to be able to categorically identify that the correct person has sent the request to remove their information because you get into this whole thing of identity theft. I don't know. I still don't know the answer to that one. <laughs> it, 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 you know, it, it is complicated. I think you know part of it is that um, it, it's not very useful to the map to have something labeled um, so and so's house. You know, that's that's not that's not the purpose. Um, and I the the data working group has you know sort of got historically gotten requests about you know please remove um, my house or you know remove my name. Um, and you know we'll we'll see if there's a rise in those kinds of requests with GDPR um, or not. Um, as I, I said in the slide about sort of the right to be forgotten, um, that right is really tied to consent. So if we are looking at, um, so for, for OSM, we're looking at legitimate basis. And so whether or not there is a legitimate basis for certain information to be on the map, um, that review, I think, will continue the way it has um, because privacy of individuals has been something that DWG does has looked at before, um, and it sort of remains to be seen whether there's going to be significant, um, significantly more requests or not. Okay, just two things. One personal remark about this email address thing. There is a clause in the GDPR that if you make an information manifestly public yourself, then you lose any protection rights in this information. So it's pretty much in line with our on-the-ground mapping rule. If someone's putting out a sign or some other, conveys the measure in another way public, then we can pick it up. If it's not publicly usable, it shouldn't get in the database anyway. So it's pretty much in, in line with our practice. And my question is more about, does it make sense to have a longish and intimidating terms of use to anybody? Or shouldn't we just uh, split it up into terms of use appropriate for somebody just adding a POI and a box to tick about terms of use if people start want to start to use the metadata? And why not just split it up so that we have two levels and have it more appropriately ensure that people actually re um, read the terms of use? If there's some agreement, I mean, it's um, it's a change in the, um, in the user interface of the um, mail port, and uh, you have to convey this information through the uh, award system. It's technically possible, so I won't say we'll do it earlier than in six months, but uh, that's a reasonable uh, time schedule. If it's only a question about technical implementation, I think it's more a question of if you want it. I would prefer it personally, but uh, I'm not sure if there's a majority with this. I don't know if you had a if you've read the draft. Um, I think I am quite interested in the discussion of the on the mailing list. I'm not sure if I read the latest version of the draft. It's a month ago or so. Yeah. Um, so I think that the things uh, so there's sort of two sections to the draft terms of use. There's one section that's really focused on GDPR um, and sort of what are appropriate uses, um, and then there's another section that is uh, describing sort of uh, other things that we've heard historically prohibited, like spam and things like that. Um, so the thing with having a terms of use uh, is uh, you do want it to include all of the things that are prohibited. Um, because if you don't, then someone's going to come back later and say, wait a minute, you didn't say anything about this, and, and argue about that. Um, the other thing is that um, even if somebody doesn't have a community project of any kind, uh, part of the restrictions that are in that are going to be in the new terms of use 
is that you can't uh, give this data to somebody else who's going to use it in an inappropriate way. So any individual could theoretically do that once they have access. So part of the reason of including all of that is to sort of include this, you know, don't, trying to get around the terms of use is also a violation of the terms of use. Okay, just some question back. So if you don't exhibit the data to those who haven't ticked the extra box, so we are fine, aren't we? So I'm, not, I'm not sure I understand the question. Okay, the idea was uh, to split it up and to have an extra box to tick to see the data. So even yes. if you an account, have an account but haven't ticked the box, then you can edit, but you cannot see other person's personal data. That is the idea, yes. Okay. <laughs> but you wouldn't. The idea is actually that the terms of use are the way they are now, so that we don't actually have to change anything for people that are not in. What you were suggesting on would require changing the processes for logged in users, so you would have two categories those that tick the box and those that hadn't ticked the box. And, and that's what we're trying to avoid. So the terms of use are supposed to make everything okay for with the current process that we have now, just for people that are not logged in, they have to. One way to think of it is, everyone who edits the map would have to take that box. Yeah. And the primary purpose for having an account is to edit the map. We could do a strict down terms of use for those who don't edit the map. But that's a small group. If you're board. just looking at the map, you don't have to be logged in. Does that yeah, sure. Right. I'm just talking about the not so small number of users who have um, just want just to add a POI or something. Uh, really simple alerts that don't need interaction with other uh, mappers. So different different topic is something that we might touch on later or on the list again. I have a small question, but before I ask the question, I want to say on behalf of the OSMF board, huge thank you to the licensed working group for dealing with all this, because it would have fallen on our shoulders otherwise, and we would be have totally unable to do it. So it's, it's, a, it's a huge amount of work, and I really appreciate what you've done, and, and Kathleen, for, for making the presentation and sort of explaining things to everyone else. It's really important work. Simon, Paul, Wade. <laughs> All of you, of course. <laughs> so, the, the small question that I have is, now we are putting out the planet file all the time and we say this is under the ODBL license. And the ODBL license has a clear wording about you, you cannot add extra conditions to something that is under ODBL. So you, you cannot say, this is under ODBL, but you must not do, you must not stalk people with this data or something. It's not allowed. Um, in the ODBL, so, so this will probably mean that we'll have to somehow find a way to say, okay, here's this file, but only half of it is under ODBL, and the other half, the like, usernames and maybe timestamps are not under the ODBL, but have these extra conditions. Is there, have you sort of, is there a legal vehicle that we can use to, to accomplish that? Um, so it's, it's not quite that, um so, so what we're doing, what we will, we will be doing is that uh, if the file is still under ODBL, but in order to have access to the file, you have to agree to the terms. So you sort of make this contractual agreement with uh, on terms in order to get access to the file. Does that make sense? So there, will be, there, there are two different files, one without the metadata, right, and then one with the metadata. And in order to get to the metadata, in order to like physically have access, you need to agree to the terms. So, so, the, so you you do that, and then you get the file. So the 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 limitations are not in the file itself. There's something that you agree to before you can have access. I mean, I'm I'm just thinking. Um, with that, like, I mean, if, if I get the file from the OSMF and I say, yes, I want you to stalk someone, and now I have an OTBL file, and I put that on my website, say, and someone else comes along and grabs it, and 
doesn't say, I don't have a checkbox, and then they stalk someone. Well, you can't put it on your website. Yeah, but you can't go after the stalker then. That's kind of what I'm saying. You just have to go after me. And then the stalker's like, no, oh, can't touch me. Is that? Well, well, okay. So, so first, right, it would be a violation of the terms for you to put it on the website without any protection, of course. And then if you're, if somebody, you know, uses this, uh, you know, it is not easy to catch every single violation of a terms of use, right? Of course. Um, it is certainly possible that somebody could violate the terms of use uh, and then provide the data to somebody who then uses it uh, inappropriately. Um, the OSMF uh, does not have the capability to stop a stalker. Right? That's what the police are for, yeah. really. Um, we, what we want to do is cut off access. So if you give the information to somebody, all we can do, uh, and all we've ever been able to do, is to cut off future access. And so we would cut off that bad, that bad actor's future access by cutting off your access. <laughs> Thank you. 